Hi everyone, I'm Allison Claire Decker. I'm a practicing attorney in the United States and the owner of Allison Claire Law, a law firm that focuses on providing fractional general counsel legal services, conducting private mediations, and space law issues. I'm also a legal advisor to Just Add Astra, an international organization focused on bringing human rights to the stars. I am particularly focused on the intersection of space law and employment law, and in this presentation I'm going to discuss some of the concerns that space poses with regard to the usual privacy protections that exist in an employment relationship and, specifically, the right to keep one's health information private from one's employer. Let's begin by laying the groundwork for the internationally acknowledged right to privacy. Although the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not legally binding, given the wide support it has received from the international community and the fact that it was one of the earlier resolutions to come out of the United Nations, it is acknowledged as the foundation for the development of numerous human rights-focused treaties, agreements, and laws. And Article 12 of the Universal Declaration raises the issue of legally protecting one from arbitrary interference with one's privacy. The International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which is widely accepted within the international community, including among the spacefaring community, went on to codify at Article 17 a protection against arbitrary or unlawful interference with one's privacy, family, home, or correspondence, thus creating a legally binding international right to privacy. And this protection was designed to protect individuals from interference from both state and private entities. And you will see a similar provision in the European Convention on Human Rights that protects individuals from interference by public authorities to their private and family life, home, and correspondence, with exceptions for various important public policy and safety issues. And the right to health is included in both the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights at Articles 25 and 12, respectively. Now, there is a lack of international legislation on the specific right to privacy as to one's health or medical information, but such a right is considered to be included both within the right to privacy and the right to health. For example, the World Health Organization acknowledges the interconnectedness of health and human rights the importance of privacy in both spheres, and the overlap between the preservation of dignity and autonomy through the protection of the rights to privacy and health. And there has also been a long tradition of realizing the connection between maintaining privacy, or as it is often called secrecy, between a patient and their physician and accessibility to healthcare. You can see the marriage of these interrelated concepts in the World Medical Association's Declaration of Geneva, aka the Physician's Pledge, which includes pledges to respect the autonomy and dignity of the patient and to respect the secrets that are confined in them. Although there is not a specific codified right to privacy in American jurisprudence that is as clear-cut as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, there are various specific privacy protections contained in the Bill of Rights, including the Fourth Amendment, which provides the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, and which protects against unreasonable searches and seizures at the hands of the government. And for well over 100 years, the courts have recognized a right to privacy based not only on the evolution of historic common law protections against physical assault of one's person or property, but also based on the so-called penumbra of constitutional rights one can extrapolate from the specific rights that are listed in the Bill of Rights. In addition, various states within the United States have their own laws that protect the right to privacy. For example, the Constitution of the State of California specifically creates and protects an individual's right to privacy. In 1996, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, known as HIPAA, and usually misspelled and misconstrued by the general public, especially during the pandemic, was signed into law in the United States. Although HIPAA was largely focused on private health insurance reform, it does contain a privacy rule that is intended to limit the use and disclosure of protected health information by certain entities and to otherwise ensure the confidentiality of medical communications with individuals. 
it does not, as many seem to think it does, create a right to refuse to disclose any and all health information when such information is requested by an employer or business. And many states within the United States also have similar protections like HIPAA codified into their state's laws. Although there is no absolute right to privacy in Australia, some limited protections are recognized under the common law, such as a cause of action for breach of confidence and via various different federal, state, and territorial laws. And the Privacy Act of 1988, which primarily regulates how government entities can collect personal information and how such information should be properly stored, also includes within its scope private health service providers and requires that a patient's medical records be kept confidential except when there is a legitimate need for one to access those records. These extra protections for health records are due to the fact that such information is considered particularly sensitive and private in nature. So now let's take a moment to talk about employee privacy rights. The International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families is the closest that we get to an international convention on workers' rights. And it enshrines at Article 14 the privacy protections contained in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. It provides that no migrant worker or member of his or her family shall be subjected to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy, family, correspondence, or other communications. And it also states that each migrant worker and member of his or her family shall have the right to the protection of the laws against such interference or attacks. The Migrant Workers Convention also includes various health rights and protections. However, this international convention is not a particularly popular one and has not been signed onto by many of the leading spacefaring states. Now, America has numerous employment-related privacy laws, and while these protections vary from state to state, in general, for example, employers are not permitted to monitor or intercept personal phone calls or emails of employees, and other forms of surveillance in the workplace must be clearly communicated to employees and not be overly invasive or unrelated to a legitimate business purpose. In addition, personal information, and especially medical information, must be kept confidential, including from other employees, supervisors, and managers at work, unless disclosure is necessary, say for a reasonable workplace accommodation. And there can even be penalties for the inadvertent or negligent disclosure of such information. Employers are also prohibited from seeking out most information about an employee's health or medical history, unless it could impact the health and safety of the workplace or endanger other employees. And the right of an employer to conduct medical and physical examinations of employees is limited. Australia has very few employee-specific privacy protections, but employers are generally required to inform employees of what information is being collected and have written policies in place. Although privacy protections and laws vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, there are some common privacy rights and concepts that are nearly universally acknowledged. So first, the right to privacy within our homes and our personal lives. And of course, this assumes that one is not making one's private personal life public. So in some ways, it is simply the choice to create a private sphere within our more public daily lives. Then you have the ability to engage in private communications. This includes both traditional written correspondence and more modern forms of communications. And then there's the importance of protecting the disclosure of personal information and specifically personal health information. And the reason why we place such a high emphasis on maintaining the confidentiality of personal health information is not only because it is so deeply and inherently unique to an individual and can reveal significant other personal information about them, including private life choices, but also because we want to encourage individuals to seek out medical treatment. And the concern is that if their personal health information is not kept confidential, they will be less likely to come forward and seek medical attention when they need it. There's also the fact that the publication of private personal and health information could lead an individual to be compromised, be that something like being blackmailed, attacked by others, or even ostracized within a community. And there's also the concept that we want to limit employer intrusions into the private lives of employees. 
I think most of us can agree we don't want to give up our privacy rights as a term of our employment, but we also realize our employer may be entitled to some personal information, or rather that some personal information will need to be disclosed or will become known to our employers simply because of the employment relationship. And so there's a general acceptance that an employer may be able to intrude somewhat into an individual's privacy rights as long as that intrusion is limited for a legitimate business purpose and the confidentiality of an employee's personal or medical information is maintained. And maintaining some separation between an employee's private and work life and preserving that distance between the employee and the employer is also considered beneficial to employee well-being and is thought to promote a more positive work environment. So let's talk a bit about the invasive nature of living and working in space. As the space environment that one lives and works in has to be constantly monitored, those living and working in space also have to be closely monitored. This includes significant personal, biological, and medical information that an employer would not normally keep track of or be expected to have access to. For example, most employers do not monitor your heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, at least during pre and post pandemic times, oxygen levels, radiation exposure, food and beverage intake, bowel movement, sleep cycle, etc. But that information is routinely collected for astronauts who often wear or are surrounded by biosensors that take various biological and physiological measurements to determine the health and well-being of each individual crew member. This collected information in turn impacts decisions as to habitat resources, for example, how much food should be consumed, and any necessary changes that need to be made to the controlled environment, such as temperature changes. This information is also valuable for protecting the general health and safety of individual crew members and the entire crew, creating a safe living and working environment in space. And it can be factored into staffing decisions for particular missions and activities. And there are other forms of monitoring, such as video cameras throughout most space habitats, which are there to make sure that no dangerous situations are developing, to monitor and document experiments and other space work, and to ensure that crew members are not engaging in behavior that might endanger themselves, other crew members, or the installation itself. But the trade-off is that this monitoring can also document many activities that are normally kept private from employers, including eating, exercising, sleeping, grooming, etc. Another issue is that closed quarters can lead to a lack of private space and privacy. And this is somewhat intuitive. Right now, space habitats are extremely cramped, so there's just a general lack of space and a lack of privacy, since most physical air areas are shared with multiple people who are quite literally living and working on top of each other, and who are going to become intimately familiar with one's routines and activities in a way that doesn't normally occur outside of one's household. Another area of concern is that communications can be easily intercepted and monitored and access to communications can be denied. At this point in time, an astronaut cannot simply pick up their personal cell phone and make a call, send a text, or send off a tweet while in space. Instead, all communications have to be routed through a computer system that is controlled back on Earth. And there are data limits as to how much information can be sent or received and when it can be sent or received, though that is mainly due to our current technical limitations and satellite coverage. But this means that if one wanted to cut off all communications, intercept all communications, or monitor all communications, it would be relatively easy to do so, given that there are currently no alternative communication systems available for use in space. So, Let's imagine a scenario where an employee on a work break uses their personal cell phone to call their doctor about test results or current medical symptoms they are experiencing. In a traditional Earth setting, the employer should not be able to prohibit, intercept, or monitor that call. In space, the opportunities for an employer to violate the privacy of that same doctor-patient communication are manifold. So let's talk about how we can create space-specific privacy guidelines. NASA's current privacy rules for astronauts aboard the International Space Station set a clear minimum standard. 
NASA astronauts on the ISS have individual private crew quarters, which, while small, allowed them a private space and time away from others and video cameras. And they are allowed to turn off cameras outside of working hours. They don't have to ask for permission to make calls or send emails and are provided with separate personal and work email accounts. But NASA does limit who can send emails to their astronauts as a way to avoid spam or junk mail. But NASA astronauts are typically government employees or members of the military and, as such, usually experience more invasions of privacy from their employer than a civilian employee working for a private employer. So we need to consider new rules for commercial space missions and commercial space travelers that protect the privacy rights that private citizens enjoy back on Earth. So first off, we can limit the monitoring and collection of personal data. Only information that is necessary to ensure the overall health and safety of the crew should be monitored and collected. In other words, the intrusions made should be as limited as possible. Biometric data collection should be limited to what is absolutely necessary to ensure minimum health guidelines, such as radiation exposure, cardiac monitoring during dangerous activities like spacewalks, or if particular concerns have been raised as to a crew member's health or well-being. Likewise, video recording should be limited to public work areas of any installation and focus solely on recording scientific experiments or in monitoring particularly vulnerable areas, such as hatches or critical equipment. Also, there should be designated private areas, both shared spaces like a kitchen galley or place of worship, and spaces specific to individual crew members, like a cabin or berth, to allow for private interactions and activities. Another would be to strictly control the distribution of medical and other personal information. This would essentially be the same as the current rules and regulations we already have back on Earth. And a good example of how this can actually be carried out in space is seen in the Inspiration4 Netflix documentary, where the families of the four civilian astronauts were not permitted to have access to the raw video footage taken of the crew members due to privacy concerns and specifically due to the personal medical information of some of the astronauts that was contained in those videos. And we should also allow for unmonitored access to private communication systems. This may be somewhat more aspirational at this point, given current technological limitations, but astronauts should be able to have unhindered private communications with anyone they choose to communicate with. This is essential to not only preserving an astronaut's mental well-being by allowing them to privately communicate with their support systems back on Earth when they might be millions of miles away from home and unable to return for months or years at a time, and it is also the only way that private employees will be able to communicate and potentially enforce any workplace violations or other unsafe working conditions. Well, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions, are looking to hire a space consultant, or just wanna chat about space law. You can find me on LinkedIn and Twitter, and of course, you can always reach me via the Allison Claire Law website. Also, please feel free to join the USA Live panel on November 19th at 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific Time and 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time as I and the rest of our panel discuss law, ethics, and human rights in space.